All right, let's do it. Morning, everyone. Welcome to Data Privacy Vault 101. Um, today, we're going to go over what data privacy vaults are and how you can use them to isolate, protect, and then use your sensitive data. Um, really appreciate you guys being here. I know there's a lot of cool workshops going on this morning, so honored that you would come and spend your time with us. Um, hopefully, we'll have some good content for you. Quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. First, what is a data privacy vault? Um, where does it fit into my stack? You know, what's it used for? Then we'll look at some real-world examples of data privacy vaults. You know, how are other companies using them, both big companies and startups? What are their use cases? Then we'll actually get into a hands-on workshop where we'll build our own, you know, quote-unquote data vault, just to illustrate some concepts. And then we'll wrap things up. Cool. So let's jump in here with something that I think we can all agree on. Working with sensitive data is pretty hard. Raise your hand if you work with sensitive data or you've built a product that has to use sensitive data at any point. Just show of hands. Most people here, right? Has anyone had a particularly pleasant experience working with sensitive data? OK. If you have, I want to talk to you. But it <laughs> seems like no one really falls into that bucket. Um, but yeah, working with sensitive data is hard, right? Anyone have any kind of horror stories or war stories that they'd be willing to share? Or maybe even just like, you know, what's an example of a time that you had to work with sensitive data? Anyone? How about this? Has anyone had to do compliance before? Show of hands. Either PCI compliance, SOC 2 compliance. Has anyone ever built a permissioning system or access controls from the ground up? Show of hands. Anyone have to build that kind of thing? A couple people in the back, right? Um, in general, you know, have anyone have to do, had to do privacy reviews or you know, file data access requests? Show of hands. Cool, right? So you know, in general, I think the point here is that working with sensitive data is hard. And um, it's, it's very complex. You know? There's kind of two ends of the spectrum here. You can either just store everything in plain text, which is obviously the least complex. Don't do that. Um, or you know, on the other side of the spectrum, you can sort of maximize data privacy by tokenizing your database completely, right? Building your own governance systems, doing data de-identification, isolation, key management. And that's hard, right? That's a lot of different disciplines. You need a really established you know, group of engineers. Um, it's tough. And a lot of the times, teams will fall somewhere on this spectrum, right? There's more that they can do to protect their data, but you know, maybe some of the things aren't as high priority. Uh, they're hard to build. Um, you're still de deciding to build versus buy, et cetera. And you know, not only is it complex and hard to build, but as a developer, you constantly have to evaluate this trade-off of data privacy versus data utility, right? the degree to which your data is private, secure, risk-free, um, versus the actual usefulness of that data, right, for your internal team, for your customers, your users. And again, you know, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum here. On one end, you can just store everything in plain text, which again, don't do that, right? Uh, but if you do that, you kind of can use the data however you want. It's maximally useful to you, right, as the data warden. And on the other hand, you could completely tokenize your database. Right? So sure, you could store tokens for everything, right? But then how do you do things like analytics? Right? How do you use that data in downstream applications? How do you share that data with your internal teams? Um, all that becomes really hard. Um, so you know, and I'll give you an example of this. Uh, at my previous company, I worked at Google. And the way we handled this, right, even at Google, is you know, for a lot of our databases, we basically had multiple copies. One copy would be anonymized and completely redacted. The other one would be pseudonymous. And we literally had a manual provisioning system where I would basically say, well, I want access to this database with this level of you know, permissions. Here's a long list of reasons why I need it. Someone would manually review that and then whitelist my Google user ID. And that was just you know, managed through this very legacy process, uh, even at a company like Google, which is to say that this is hard stuff, right? So the question we want to address today is, how do you get the best of both worlds? Right? How can you secure your data, right? really do everything you can to keep your user data safe, secure, private? Right? 
maximize the utility of that data, right? Enable things like analytics, internal data sharing. And then how can you do this in a way that doesn't require you to hire a 50-person strong security and engineering team? So to talk about how we can achieve this, I'm going to hand it over to Evis, who will introduce the concept of data privacy vaults. All right, awesome. Thanks, Akshat. So I think we covered and tried to get across this point that privacy security is hard. It's not super easy to do. Um, but then you do sometimes have to make this trade-off between privacy, security, and utility. And so with this is really where data privacy vaults come into play. And, and it's, it's this idea where um, you really don't have to make this trade-off. And you can kind of have the best of both worlds, where you can have a lot of security, as much as you really can have, a lot of privacy. Um, but you also have a lot of utility of the data as well, without com com compromising any of that privacy. So I think the first question is, what is a data privacy vault? And this is how we try and define it. So data privacy vault is a secure, isolated database designed to store, manage, and use sensitive data. So I think there's a lot that's kind of packed in that sentence. So what I want to do is I actually want to unpack each of those words and kind of talk about um, what, what does that exactly mean? What are the, each of those words, secure, isolate, database, store, manage, what does that really mean? So what does it mean to have a, uh, or to be secure? So the data privacy vault should have native encryption, tokenization, data masking, other privacy pr uh, preser preservation technologies built in. So things like um, differential privacy. Um, how do you make sure that the data you're storing is encrypted at rest, in transit, uh, and then if, as well as while it's in use? What does it mean for it to be isolated? So for us, this means that it should be in a segregated network um, with privileged access. So I've talked to customers who will actually have two separate production environments. They'll have a normal production environment that's hooked up to their normal web app or iOS app, um, and they'll actually have a separate production environment. And that separate production environment, that's behind a VPN and a privileged network, and that's where all their sensitive data lives. And for all their non-PII, non-PCI data, that's sitting in their sort of normal production environment. And that's their way of segregating their sensitive data from their normal data, and really having tightly sort of green control over who accesses that sensitive data, uh, in what way, and what do they do with it, audit, logging, observability, and so on. So what does it mean for the data privacy vault to be a database? Um, so for us, we think of this as it can be either an OLAP or an OLTP. It can be something like NoSQL. It can be an RDS database. Depending on the different use cases you have for the data privacy vault, you may want to enable different, um, you know, different technologies to enable that. Um, there's a lot of flexibility here. I think the key idea is that it doesn't, have to, it doesn't fit into any one bucket. It's really use case dependent. Um, and depending on what you're looking to do with the data, you can pick the right technology that drives that. What does it mean to store that data? So the data privacy vault should have high availability, high throughput, should have support for structured and unstructured data. We talked to a lot of customers who want to store normal PII, structured data, PCI data, but as well as unstructured data. Maybe they're doing KYC, so they want to store license pictures, or they want to store um, passport photos. They should be able to store that in a privacy-preserving way um, without having to offload that to another system. What does it mean for the data privacy vault to manage? So one of the core aspects of a data privacy vault is this idea around data governance. It should be natively built into the vault itself. So things like ABAC, RBAC, and PBAC, being able to manage roles directly within um, the data privacy vault, policies that define how people can access the data, in what format, in what way, from what IP ranges, how many times can they access this data. Uh, and then lastly, zero trust architecture. And that's, I think, a phrase um, or a concept that gets thrown a lot, around a lot. You know, for us, the way we think about this is that every access request, every call that's made to the vault is evaluated in real time um, for the right access, for the right data, in the right format. Um, so we want to make sure that there's consistent observability and evaluation across the entire vault layer. And then lastly, um, what does it mean to use that sensitive data now that you've stored it, you're managing it in a secure and isolated database? Uh, and we think of that as something like privacy preserve, uh, preserving analytics, secure cloud functions on sensitive data, things like partially homomorphic encryption. Can you include that within um, the encryption layer of the database? Can you run um, some functions, aggregate functions, uh, exact match functions without actually decrypting any of the data, without having to put that data in memory, running your function, then encrypting it again at rest? Can you do that without ever decrypting that? Um, and then secondly, around secure cloud functions, this is something we see pretty often. So now that you have your sensitive data within a vault, it doesn't really make much sense to then bring that back over to your servers to then make a call down to your API, you know, to some external service. You really want to do it directly from the vault. That way you totally isolate your own database. Um, so how do you do that directly from the vault? So I think we've tried to define what is it, what are the key components of it, 
what are some of the key concepts you want to think about when building that data privacy vault? Naturally, the next question is, how does this fit into my stack? And you know, a lot of the customers that I talk to have, have this idea in their head that, that my data privacy vault should replace my normal database. And, and we think of them as really being complementary to your data storage and processing layers, to your data layers, to your other databases. It's not, it's not a, 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 you know, a replacement, it's really more of a, you know, of a partner of a friend where it's purpose-built designed to store that sensitive data. Uh, and then your other databases can store your other transactional data, your, your metadata, your non-PII data that, that you, you, know, you want to have. Um, so you really want to think about isolating the scope of the data privacy vault to really just storing that sensitive data and not sort of shoving you know, everything else in there. The idea is that it should also be able to talk to your other data storage and processing layers. So maybe you have um, a Postgres 11 driver that talks to your other Postgres databases so you can communicate back and forth. Uh, maybe talks to your other cloud services to Okta. You know, I've talked to companies and, and customers who like to store some of their Okta IDs and Okta data within data privacy vaults. That's one way you can enable that. And then lastly, around this idea of external APIs. So if you're looking to process payments with Stripe, <clears throat> issue cards through Marketa, um, maybe get a credit score from Experian, how do you do that directly from the data privacy vault? Can you have something like maybe a serverless layer on top of the data privacy vault that allows you to talk to these downstream APIs without having to build something directly from your own backend? So now that we've tried to define you know, what it is, what are the components of it, how does this fit into my architecture, um, let's talk about some use cases. So we think of these in sort of four different buckets. The first is compliance, so things around PCI, SOC 2, HIPAA, data residency is also a big one. Um, how do you store the most sensitive data, maybe your car data, your ACH data within a data privacy vault while storing your other maybe non-sensitive data within your normal database? Um, a data privacy vault is, is great for that. Can you reduce your PCI scope to get to market faster if you're a new stage fintech? Um, by adopting a data privacy vault as opposed to building all that out yourself. Secondly is around tokenization. Can you do things like payment acceptance, card issuance, money movement? This comes back to this idea that you're storing PCI data, your PAN data, your, your maybe your ACH data uh, within the data privacy vault. Can you use tokenization to be able to replace that, reduce your PCI scope, secure that data, uh, and then just store the tokens on your end? Those can be format preserving tokens that really look like the original pieces of data um, but don't hold any of that sort of sensitive intrinsic value. Data governance is also a big one as well. Things around data sharing, whether it's for internal use cases or external use cases. Um, I think specifically within ten, uh, FinTech, you know, there's a lot of data that's shared with external partners. So how do we do that in a secure uh, and privacy compliant way? How do you make sure that the right person has the right access to the data in the right format without having to build this access control layer on top of it yourself? Uh, and that's where this idea of policy-based access controls you can start to get really granular to say, my developers in the US should only be able to have access to this data within this defined IP range, within this geo, uh, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. My customer service folks should also only be able to have the data, uh, access to that data during that time as well. Um, and this really starts to scope down the way that people have access to it. Uh, and then lastly is around secure compute. So depending on what you're looking to do with that data, maybe you're looking to understand, you know, you're a card issuer and you want to understand um, how many cards have I issued, uh, you know, to which customers and which geo uh, without running that on any um, sensitive data. You want to do that without decrypting the data. You can do that with something like a secure compute with analytics. Maybe with workflows, you're looking to call a KYC provider like Alloy or Persona or Cognito or Jumio, um, but you really don't want to pull back any of that social security numbers or address data back into your own server side. Um, you want to do that directly from the vault. So how do you enable these workflows to make sure that once somebody passes my KYC check, I then do a credit check. They fall within my you know, range that they should sign up as a customer, my decisioning engine, my custom credit model, and then how do I then make a call out to some card issuer like Marketa or others uh, to issue that person a card without having to touch any of that sensitive data kind of traveling back and forth on my side. Awesome. So I think we've, we've tried to define what is a data vault, how does it fit into my, into my stack, what are some of the use cases around it, uh, and then now we want to get into um, how have real life customers uh, and, and companies really put this, this paradigm, this idea, this architectural concept uh, into practice and what does that look like for them? So I'm gonna hand it over to Akshat to talk about our first uh, use case here. Awesome. So I'm, I'm just curious, show of hands, who's heard of a data privacy vault before? At least the way I've just described it. Just show of hands. Okay, a good number of you, which is actually surprising to me because I feel like this is one of the industry's best kept secrets. You know, like, this is not just a theoretical thing, and we've actually seen some of the biggest companies implement this architectural pattern 
and now others are kind of catching on, including uh, startups, uh, especially in fintech, where there's a ton of sensitive data. So one thing we want to do is actually show you how this has been used in the past to solve some of the issues we talked about. So to start off, um, let's talk about ADN. Who's heard of ADN? Can anyone tell me what ADN does? Any brave souls? Too early in the morning. <laughs> All right. Well, ADN, if you haven't heard of them, is a credit card processor, payments processor, right? Um, and uh, they're, they're huge. They process a ton of payments across the globe. And so you can imagine that they work with a lot of PCI data. So um, and ADN published a blog post about this, which I'll share the QR code to and stuff if you want to read through this in detail, right? which is sort of how we got this behind the curtain view. But essentially, let's look at what ADN needed to, what, what the requirements were. Right, when they were building their PCI, PII data storage solution. So first, right, they needed security. Huge company operating in a regulated space internationally. Obviously, they have very stringent security and privacy requirements. So the first thing is, you know, we want to make sure that you're doing everything in a compliant way, You've got your encryption, rotation, all that good stuff, right? But crucially, they also needed performance out of their PII data storage. Right? It wasn't just going into cold storage um, for you know, compliance use cases, right? where you just have to hang on to the data for a certain amount of time in case uh, the government needs it. No, their, their data was actually being used by downstream applications. Right? So they built a merchant reporting dashboard, which actually consumed this PII data, which means that you know, it needs to scale, it needs to have high throughput, it needs to be available, distributed. They also wanted to enable analytics on it. right? Um, they wanted to give their internal teams, maybe their anti-fraud team, right, maybe their billing team, access to that data so that they could run analytics and gain actionable insights from it. And then finally, they wanted data redaction and governance, right? Sort of similar to the previous point, they wanted to share that data with their internal teams, but they wanted to make sure every internal team got just the right amount of data they needed. So a common example of this is, you know, I've got information about a customer. I want to give the marketing team access to their name and email so that the marketing team can run a campaign, right? Uh, but nothing else. I want to give customer support access to maybe their phone number and maybe the last four digits of their SSN, right? So that they can call you on the phone, verify who you are, and give you support over the phone. And then maybe I want to give the billing team access to you know, some of their credit card information, right? How do you give access to all these different teams with the right amount of permissions without just creating copies of your database, right? So with all these requirements in mind, right, let's look at why an encrypted database isn't enough. Um, this is a QR code, by the way, to their blog post where they sort of break all this down in detail. Um, it might be a little bit hard from the back, so if you want to just come up to the front, grab this, and save it for later, uh, feel free to get up and, and do that. Um, also, I should have mentioned this earlier. If there's any questions at any point, Feel free to jump in, raise your hand, interrupt me at any point. Um, let's just keep this pretty casual. But getting back to why wasn't an encrypted database enough, right? So encryption definitely helps you get security and compliance. In fact, it's a requirement, right? And it's a native feature of most databases, nothing new. I'm sure all of you have worked with encrypted databases before. But the issue is that encryption alone doesn't solve all of the requirements that ADN had, right? So namely, how do you run analytics on encrypted data? Right? If you want to run analytics on it, you're going to have to decrypt it. And by decrypting it, suddenly your back end is now exposed to that data. And a lot of the privacy and security concerns that you were trying to get around, you're sort of back at square one. Right? Using the data in downstream applications. Right? Again, if you want to send this to a merchant reporting app, then suddenly your back end for that application needs to be able to decrypt all that data um, and send it along, right? putting it back in compliance scope. Um, and uh, there might be performance concerns also, right? which we know from a lot of like, strong encryption techniques where you do maybe field level encryption. Right? That has a lot of performance challenges. So it may not be ready for a production level app. And then finally, you know, how do you share different views of that data with internal teams? Again, going back to that use case with marketing, billing, um, anti-fraud. right? How do you share the right columns or rows with those teams? Um, and with encryption alone, you, you can't, which is why an encrypted database wasn't enough. 
And so the solution is that ADN built their own data vault and tokenization solution. Um, this is straight from the blog, uh, blog post, this whole diagram. And it basically goes over the kind of architecture that they built. I've overlaid this orange box, right, which essentially outlines what their data vault is. Essentially what the flow here is, is you've got payments data coming in on the, on the left-hand side here, right? This goes into the data vault. Now what the data vault does, right, is the data vault identifies what data is PCI data, what data is PII data, you know, what data do we not want to expose to internal teams. Uh, it has a tokenization engine, which generates tokens for those things, right? Maybe format preserving tokens, different kinds of masking depending on what teams need. And then it also has an isolated store of the actual plain text data. And what that data vault can then do is actually feed two separate data lakes, right? So first, you have a data lake of just tokenized data, which is meant for your internal teams to consume, right? What this lets you do is let your internal teams get the right amount of um, data that they need from one single source of truth, though, right? And then they have a separate data lake for their actual merchant reporting app, which has the PII data, right? You can make sure that only the right people have privilege to this data lake. So, you know, just to simplify this view down a little bit, what we're really doing is we're consolidating all the sensitive data to one source of truth, right, which is the data vault. And the data vault, with its built-in, you know, tokenization, encryption, uh, and data governance features, is basically about able to provide each of these consumers of the data with exactly the right amount of data they need in the right format they need, subject to all the right privileges, all natively from the concept of a vault which really simplifies your, you know, maybe oversimplifies a little bit your architecture. But that means, you know, you get tokenized data for analytics, where all the fields that you don't need are tokenized and everything else is, uh, is computable. Um, your merchant reporting app gets data in plain text, right? So your merchants can actually see their information on their dashboard. Um, your marketing team gets only the columns they need, right, and only the rows they need. Maybe you want to give your marketing team in the U.S. only access to your U.S.-based customers, right? You can configure those real level policies. And same for your customer support team. Cool. Let's see another example of this with Netflix. And I'll give it back to Evis to talk about that. All right. So I think we've, we've all heard of Netflix. Probably watch it a little too much. So let's look at what their architecture looked like before they implemented a data vault. So you can see on the left-hand side you have, or this semblance of this central isolated data lake. Um, you have a lot of different routes going to a lot of different applications. On the right-hand side, you have internal apps like the talent app, FP&A app, contract app. Uh, and then on the left, you have sort of consumers of that as well. Uh, an ETS app for, uh, for HR, you have another HR app. Uh, data pipelines kind of mixed in with all of this. And, and that's, that caused a couple of problems for Netflix. One of the first ones was this idea of data fragmentation. So you have a lot of point-to-point -point solutions, a lot of point-to-point -point connections to manage. Thinking about it from an engineering perspective, that's super hard on your developers. There's a lot of overhead just making sure that these are consistently running one service goes down, how do you make sure that another service wasn't infect, uh, impacted? Um, this, I mean, this can just keep you sort of busy for, for a very long time without making a, any actual real progress. Um, data deduplication, so no single source of truth. I see this all the time when talking to a lot of uh, enterprise customers with a lot of different business lines, a lot of different products. Um, how do you make sure you have a master customer record across all your different customers? Especially as companies grow through acquisition, how do you start to unify those into a single source uh, and then feed your downstream data systems from that centralized source. Um, it's really hard, especially with different sets of data floating around, like Akshat talked about. Um, you know, with Google and with other companies, they typically tend to make copies of this data. Uh, this is the Capital One issue that happened, um, I think, seven or eight years ago now, uh, where they just had a copy of the data sitting in an S3 bucket. And then lastly, is around data governance. So how do you make sure that the right customer gets the right data? In what format? Is it masked? Is it encrypted? Is it tokenized? Who has access to it? How do you make sure you enforce that access? How do you have auditing over that access? How do you feed that into your SIEM system? Uh, and then lastly, how do you comply with DSARS? CCPA and GDPR, um, they enforce that. So how do you make sure that when a customer says, hey, I want you to delete my data, or forget about my data, how do you make sure you've actually gone through with that? Um, those are all pretty complicated things that Netflix was struggling with. And then this is what it looked like after the vault. So you can see from, a, from an architecture diagram perspective, it's much more simplified. You now have sort of centralized everything into the data vault. You have an identity layer that sits on top of that and really manages governance across the board. 
So you reduce the number of integrations and complexity of managing those integrations. That frees up your engineering team to actually focus on value-added business drivers, not just managing integrations on a day-to-day -day basis. You've been able to consolidate multiple sources of sensitive data into one secure source of truth. Um, you now have a good idea of every single customer, the products that they have, the data that uh, belongs to that customer. It's not spread out across different data marts or different data silos. Um, we think of this as this idea of shift left, which is if you're gonna implement a data vault, you wanna implement it closest to the source of collection. So right after your web app, right after your mobile app. That way the first thing that happens is the data comes into the data vault and then you can decide from there how you want to pass that downstream, but then that continues to act as your single source of truth. Uh, and the last is around the central uh, governance uh, engine. Um, so this enforces role-based access controls for Netflix on downstream users and applications. Um, so, uh, so they went through this entire process and I think we're, we're oversimplifying it here. This was not an easy process for them to go through after having, you know, talking to the team there. Uh, it definitely took a long time. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's something that's hard to do. Um, but it made their lives so much easier and I think it really started to free up some of their uh, engineering folks for, for other work uh, and not having just to constantly maintain this massive um, sort of service mesh of services and data layer of databases. So we wanna talk about another example as well. So this is an early stage neobank. I think you know, the idea I wanna get across is that this isn't for just large enterprise companies. You really wanna do this right from the beginning so that you're not having to backtrack at some point later on and say, well, how do I fix these problems? How do I really dedicate the time to, to try and get this right? You really wanna do it from the very beginning. So an early stage uh, neobank that we work with, uh, they serve the underbanked market. Um, they're up and coming uh, and just recently launched. Uh, and they wanted to build their architecture right from the beginning with data security and privacy in mind. So they had a couple different requirements. The first was they needed to make sure that the data vault, uh, data privacy vault, um, was highly secure and it was scalable with, uh, with them as they grew. Obviously in the beginning, they're not gonna have as many customers, but the idea is that they're gonna grow pretty quickly. So how do they make sure that they have an infrastructure that scales as they scale? Secondly is they want to completely isolate their environment from any PCI data. This is something that I see all the time, you know, especially in the FinTech space. For most FinTech companies, data privacy, data security is extremely important, but that's not how they go to market. And typically it comes down to this build versus buy decision. And I think you know, a lot of the early stage companies that I talk to typically tend to, um, tend to want to buy so they can focus on actually delivering value and rolling up products and getting to market faster. Um, so how do they isolate their environment from the front end to make sure that any PCI data they're collecting isn't hitting their front end infrastructure, uh, and then as well as their back end? How do they make sure that none of that data is sitting within their back end? They don't have to worry about PCI scope. It's a you know, five or 10 minute SAQ fill, uh, you know, form you fill out and then you're on your way. They want to integrate directly with Visa debit processing services for card issuance. So I remember going through this and um, you know, Visa is obviously a legacy company uh, and we had to work with some SOAP APIs, which was, which was fun. Uh, so those still do exist. Um, but they, how do you do that directly from the vault? Uh, and then how do you do that to make sure that data is secure and, and transit across different services? Uh, and then lastly, they want to integrate directly with their KYC provider ideology. So as a card issuer, it was really important for them to run KYC on their customers before uh, you know, they issued any cards, particularly for you know, the market segment that they're trying to serve. Um, they want to make sure that somebody really fell within their uh, right decision range and right sort of comfortable range um, for them to issue a card. Uh, and then after that, be able to call um, DPS. So this is what their uh, architecture ended up looking like. They had their different apps. These were their web apps, their iOS, their uh, Android apps. Uh, those were talking to both their backend, so they had non-PI data that they were collecting, um, some metadata they were pushing into their customer database. There's no need for that to typically go into your data vault. And, and that just, again, reinforces this idea that the vault should be very purpose-built, very specific for just sensitive data to start, at least. Uh, and then down at the bottom, they had PI and PCI data that was going directly into the vault. So any, uh, any super sensitive data they were collecting was actually just being routed directly to the vault from their front end using SDKs, secure SDKs, uh, instead of actually going to their back end first and then making their way to the vault. Once data went into the vault, there were tokens being sent back and forth. So this flow right here, tokens coming in and going back, they were storing tokens on their end. Whenever a new customer came into, um, you know, opened up their app, for example, they had an Okta ID. As soon as that customer would come in, it'd fire off an event, they would take that Okta ID, look in their database, look at the tokens that they had for that customer, uh, and then if it was just for, you know, non-sensitive data, for PII data, they would just swap those tokens for, for the data and display certain types of data within that customer app. They also had a custom credit model, so we talked about this decisioning aspect for them. It was really important for them to make sure that 
customer actually fell right within their decision range. Uh, and then on top of this, I really orchestrated this entire workflow was a serverless integration platform. So within the data vault sort of layer here, you had a serv we had a serverless platform that really facilitated access across different integrations. So from Visa DPS to ideology, PII data was going in and it was coming back. Uh, and that's okay, because that's, that's what the data privacy vault was built for. Uh, and the serverless platform actually helped sort of coordinate that. And then lastly were these different customer uh, or internal applications. You had other internal apps, you had a customer service uh, application. Those talk directly to the vault. So using APIs, they can just make a call directly to the vault to say, I want this set of data for this particular customer, this field, these fields should be um, masked, these certain fields should be redacted. Uh, maybe for um, customer service account verification, I ask the customer what are the last four of their SSN. They don't need to see the entire SSN, they can just see the last four, you can mask everything else. Through one API, you can get all of those different types of data um, hooked up to your different, different apps. So for them, this, this worked really well because for data they didn't need to put into the vault, they just put it into the customer DB. For data they wanted to go into the vault, they just put it directly into the vault. And then they had an orchestration layer up here to manage all their different downstream integrations, their workflows from issuance to KYC and so on. So, you know, I think in summary here, the idea again is if you're gonna do it from the beginning, if you're starting your architecture from, you know, your company from the beginning, you really wanna think about this and this should be sort of one of your first considerations when you're starting going, instead of thinking about it after the fact and then coming to this point where you're saying, well, we're starting to scale, you know, the initial version of our architecture uh, served us well, but it's really not what we need going forward. Um, how do we start to make these decisions? That becomes a much more difficult conversation. <clears throat> All right, so enough slides. Um, we're gonna get our hands dirty. So we're gonna go through building a data privacy vault, or at least a very simple one, uh, and I'm gonna turn over to Akshat to, uh, to start that process. Awesome, cool. Before we jump into this portion, any questions on what we talked about? Um, this is a good point to just pause and kind of get your thoughts. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Yes. For sure. So the question was, you know, can we talk more about the architecture of the vault itself? Like what's really going on under the hood? I don't know if we're prepared with any slides to answer that, but at a high level, right, we can sort of talk through um, all the different components that you need to build a data vault, yeah. right? So some of the high-level features that we've talked about, right, you need some kind of storage layer, right? Um, obviously, with that comes all the good things you talked about, right? So maybe take some sort of open source database, right, Cockroach or Postgres or whatever, right, and you want to build that as, like, the core of your storage solution. You got to build your query optimizers, right? You gotta write your own tokenization algorithms, right? Your own encryption algorithms, right? You need to um, basically do that mapping from the data that's coming in down to your actual database. So that's one big pillar of it, right? Is kind of storage. The other big pillar we talked about is governance, right? How do you build data governance natively into the vault? So this typically requires coming up with some sort of policy-based access scheme, right? So you can take open source things like open policy agent, right, and try to work that in to your, to your vault. But really what the outcome is, you wanna basically have this governance layer on top of your vault, where as requests for data are coming in, they're being continuously evaluated, right? What permissions does this person have, right? And based on those permissions, what data can I show them? So that data coming out of the vault also needs to be redacted or masked appropriately based on those permissions. And then the final thing that we talked about was compute. Right? That's the third big pillar of your vault, which is you know, how do you make it so that the vault can talk natively to your third-party APIs, right? so that you can call a Stripe API with data in your vault without you actually having to decrypt it, right? without exposing your backend to that. And then the most important thing is all of this needs to be built on top of trusted infrastructure, right? infrastructure that's isolated, that's secure, globally distributed, um, and that is uh, available, right? Because this is gonna be a critical piece of your, of your applications. So, not sure if that answers your question, but at a high level, those are like the big building blocks. Maybe that a little bit too. Mm -hmm. so the big three pillar architecture Totally. I'm not gonna get into what Skyflow does, right? But at a high level, 
that's an excellent question, right? And it really goes back to Evis's first slide where it's like, what is a data vault? And that database piece is so important because like any database, right, when you go to create your app, you choose, you know, do I want to go with uh, Mongo, right, and have it sort of be uh, NoSQL schema-less kind of thing? Do I want maybe Postgres, right? Do I need a key value store? Those are the same considerations you need to take into account when making a data vault, right? It really depends on your use case. Um, and that's why it's so hard to build one of these from scratch, because that's just step one, and it's so core to everything that sits above that, right? Your governance, your compute. Um, so to answer your question, it really depends on your use case. Um, and the same way that you would consider building like a database or choosing a database for your app is the same thing, same set of questions you'd ask when you go and set out to build a data vault. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe to go one step deeper, and I'll try not to dig into Skyflow stuff a little too much. Um, but for us, things like scalability and availability are just super important. So having things like horizontal sharding, like that was a must have for us. Um, picking the right database was, was extremely important. And I think, you know, we went through this evaluation process where we said, here's everything that's off the shelf, here are things that we can just buy. Um, do we need to fork something, create our own UDFs for the database? Do we need to, can we just use something right off the, you know, right off the top? Um, it really depends, I think, to Akshat's point. You know, we, there, there are other data privacy vaults out there, or data vaults out there that are just strictly key value stores. There's no schema to it. You don't have this like, relational integrity between primary keys and foreign keys. They're just put data in, maybe you get some tokenized value out, uh, and that's all it does. You don't even see it, it's just a black box. And that's totally fine for if, if that's your use case. If you wanna take it a step further, you wanna say, well, I actually wanna have a schema, I wanna have tables, I wanna have columns, um, I want to be able to pull records via primary key and relate that to foreign keys, then you're probably different data types, it, different blob data stores, types, blob yeah. stores, unstructured data. Um, you're going to need something different that can handle that. I think in our experience, it's typically been a combination of, of a few different databases depending on the use case. Um, so we try to look at this from a use case perspective of what are we trying to enable, uh, and then how do we how do we pick the right technology for that? Yes, in the back. It's a fantastic question. I think um, it comes down to this idea of data security and privacy versus data utility. We kind of had a slide in the beginning which talked about, well, if you're going to tokenize everything, then how do you do anything with it, right? You really can't. Uh, and the way you do that is if you pick the right provider, build the vault in the right way, um, and you have it in a segregated environment, maybe you can run analytics on that. Um, and so that's, that's something we think is a key tenant where if you have an internal customer database, you're just storing tokens, that is kind of a... It's, I don't want to call it cold storage, but it's very static, right? You don't really do much with it, um, as opposed to maybe you have this other data stored in a segregated environment uh, under a VPN that only certain developers have access to. Maybe that's where you run your analytics. You can take that even a really step further and say, well, I'm getting really sophisticated with encryption schemes. I'm doing things with partially homomorphic encryption, order preserving encryption. I don't actually have to put the data in memory to decrypt it uh, and run a function on it. I can leave it sort of where it is, and I can run my function without ever decrypting the data. Um, so Google released a really awesome, I think it was a C++ library recently yeah. around fully homomorphic encryption, um, which was super amazing. So I think there's a lot of strides being made in the field. Um, I think we're still a little early on FHE, uh, on at least it being scalable enough for commercial use. Um, but I think these are the things that we're going to start to see. And, and to the point about use cases, right, it comes down to, do you want to run some functions? Are you looking to you know, sum up different values across your database, so you're looking to do comparison functions, you know, give me every user's birthday is above, whatever, 1990 or something like that. Um, you can do some of those today without, um, with partially homomorphic encryption and other different encryption algorithms. Um, so that's available, so I think it comes down to like, you have to segregate first and then design for use cases, uh, and that's, that's the approach that we've taken. And I think it's a great question because it really highlights why you want to use a vault for this, right? Because to your point, it depends so much on your use case. You don't want to have to implement a new solution every time your use case changes, right? So today, maybe your analytics team just needs access to the month, right, in a birthday, right? And sure, you can redact out all the other data and just provide them the month. But then tomorrow, maybe the team will actually need the whole thing. And then you want to basically let them run those analytics without decrypting the data. So, you know, that really speaks to why you want to do it right the, the first time and build a vault. Great question. Any other questions? This is great. We love audience involvement because I think it really starts <laughs> to open it up. So please, don't, uh, don't feel shy. I have a question. Uh, you pull down your slide. Yeah. Um, Probably want to talk to you. Sure. Yeah. 
This one right here? This one. Sure. So I think the question, if, if I understood correctly, was when you're collecting data, sometimes you don't know if it's private or sensitive or not. How do you make this distinction <clears throat> between do I send it directly to the vault or do I put it into my, into my database? Um, I think it's a great question. So I think to start, the first thing we do is there are some fields that are identified as PCI data. So like your PAN, your expiration date, um, you could throw a name in there if you want to. Um, CVV you're not supposed to store, so, so hopefully you're not storing that. Um, those are pretty identified up front. So I think with those, the way that we've handled that with our customers is to say, um, you want to isolate your front end completely. And the way you do that is with a secure SDK that somebody like Skyflow or others is hosting directly. You just implement that on your front end. Uh, and that way, as soon as data goes into the form, your front end infrastructure is not touching it. It's just being sent directly to the vault. Um, that's one way of doing it. So with that, I think that's the sort of base case that you should definitely do. Um, some other non-PII data, maybe metadata, maybe you're collecting you know, a name that's not attached to a PAN number. Um, you can probably put that directly in your customer database if you want. We have other customers who are, um, yeah, I'll say very sort of privacy and security um, focused, where they'll say, even if data is not PCI and it's just PII, like a social security number or a database, um, I don't want that touching my back end at all. I just want to like totally isolate myself from any of this stuff. Um, I want to put that directly into the SDK as well. Um, so that can also kind of make its way down here. So you could do something like a data ca categorization tool, like there's a bunch of these out there, security.ai, big ID, and so on, um, where you try to say, identify like, what data do I have, what's private, what's not private. Um, I think that just speaks to, if you're doing it after the fact, it's really hard. Um, because you already have this stuff already throughout your different apps, right? If you're starting from the beginning, uh, it's easy to make these decisions up front and really architect your system in the right way to handle that. Um, but if you're trying to do it after the fact, um, I would say first start with PCI data, maybe you're already taking care of that, uh, and then start going down the list of what else is most sensitive. The test that we use is like, if this piece of data got exposed uh, and you're on the front, you know, front page of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, like, would you be embarrassed and mortified and you know, would your PR people have a field day? Um, and that's, that's our sort of, yeah, bar, yes. At least, yeah, at least the most sensitive data, like a social security number, an email, for example, at least that's isolated. Uh, and at the worst case scenario, you're taking care of like your crown jewels, um, and then you're trying to manage everything else after that. Yeah, question? Ideally, right, and it, it, I think it comes down to use case again. Um, you know, for, for us, you know, we think of, um, we try to tell our customers that you really want to put, as, you know, the most sensitive data in the vault, uh, and then if you're communicating with your KYC provider and you're sending a social security number and address and so on, um, you probably want to do that directly from the vault. Um, you don't have to, right, there isn't this, for example, like PCI compliance for PI data, at least not yet, uh, where you have to manage it separately. Uh, but it also just kind of gives you that you know, peace of mind at night to say, like, hey, all this stuff's in the vault. It's already taken care of. Uh, I just have sort of everything else in, on my side. Yes? Go yeah, that, that's a great question, actually. Um, Do you want to just summarize what, uh, yeah. what Aaron was so asking? So for, for the rest of the audience, right, the question is, it boils down to, why can't I just put everything in my data vault first? It, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, are there, am I going to run into performance issues, right? Will I run into scalability challenges? And uh, as lame of an answer as it is, it, 
really depends on your use case, right? But one thing I will say is it's not uncommon to put non-PCI or non-sensitive data into the vault, right? Because data doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? If you find someone's you know, email or if you find something that on the surface may not look sensitive, right? Like maybe how many times they visited the hospital, right? An aggregate number or whatever. That could give you an in into figuring out other sensitive data, right? Through linkage attacks or an, a, a number of well-known means. So it's, very, it's not uncommon to put other data into the vault. That's not strictly speaking sensitive, right? Regarding performance, this really depends on how you approach your vault, right? Again, like I think as Evis talked about, at Skyflow, we're trying to build um, something that can scale horizontally, right? That can be a piece of your critical infrastructure. And so performance is important to us from day one. And the idea is that you can store as many records as you want, right? As many columns as you want. Um, but again, it depends on your use case, right? If you truly just need to store, you know, your credit card number, your cardholder name, expiration date, that kind of stuff, right? Then maybe your requirements are a little bit different. But in summary, um, you know, depending on your vault, it's not uncommon to store all your data there. Or maybe not all your data, right? But a lot of it, besides just your strictly PCI compliant or you know, HIPAA kind of fields. Yeah. Totally. And, and I think that's how people would traditionally use a vault, right? Separate out all the sensitive data, put it in the vault, and then you know, have some sort of link to the records. And I think that's a perfectly valid way to use um, the data vault, right? Um, but to the gentleman on the front's point, it, it really kind of depends, right? Like there was this very famous case in Massachusetts, like I think in the early 2000s, where like they, like, released some open source database for MIT. And because of that, all the health records of everyone, like every citizen in Massachusetts got, got compromised. Right? And when they were releasing it, obviously they weren't releasing like, the actual PII records. But even if one of those fields can somehow be linked back, right, um, it, it just creates this vulnerability, which will be exploited. I mean, the, the way I like to think of it is it only takes one. right? So you have to be really judicious when it comes to Am I, you know, really, do I want to, is this something, you know, maybe to use what Evis said earlier, if this data got out and was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, how much damage would it do? And I think when you kind of frame it like that, it's almost better to be defensive and put anything that's sensitive, right? Even sensitivity has many different levels, right? Very sensitive, uh, low sensitivity, but anything that's sensitive into a vault-like structure. I think just to add on to that, maybe one last point um, is around, um, so you mentioned sort of like linkage attacks, right? So you could do things like differential privacy, which is you have a data set, you add in enough noise to the data set where if you're pulling any one record out, you can't link it back to who that person is later on. Um, that's a technique to, to be able to do that. Um, there are different other ways you can handle that, but um, for sure. I mean, we, we you know, talk to customers all the time. We'll say like, hey, I have some customer data on my internal database. I have some UUID or some like customer ID. Uh, I'm gonna give you a mapping of my customer ID to all the all PII data. So if I want to pull any data back, I'm just going to pull it by customer ID. And that's their way of just like do, handling that linkage. Um, so it total, totally depends on your stance and, and sort of how, uh, yeah, how, how privacy forward you want to be. All right. Awesome. Cool. Well, with that, uh, let's jump into the workshop. Um, this will be a live coding workshop. If you've got a laptop and you'd like to follow along, welcome you to do that. Um, maybe you want to just move to the front so it's easier to see, easier to follow along. Um, if you just want to watch, that's also cool. Um, but let's jump in here. Uh, Evis, can you unlock your yeah. laptop? Cool. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to build a poor man's data privacy vault, right? It's going to be very basic, um, but essentially what we're building is Acme Pay. It is a single page app which does only one thing. It collects your credit card information and then processes a payment, right? Or it will send it downstream. Um, to, to be processed. And so what we're building is a vault where we can store some of this sensitive data, um, specifically to tokenize it and then store it, right? So we're going to build a vault with just one feature, just kind of sort of for illustrative purposes here. The high-level architecture that we're going to implement, right, is we've got this form, which I just showed you, which is going to send a bunch of PCI data. It's going to send it to our vault, right, which is going to tokenize it and store the plain text separately. 
right? So again, for illustration purposes, you know, your, your plain text data is going to sit in this database. Normally, right, you'd want this to be, this is what you'd want to be isolated, hosted on isolated infrastructure. For the purposes of this, of this kind of workshop, we're just going to pretend that this is isolated. Um, cool. We're going to be using MongoDB for this exercise, right? So if you've got a free MongoDB account already, great. If you don't, sign up for one. It's great for side projects. Um, just get an Atlas database going. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll create one kind of consumer app for our data vault, which is this internal dashboard that Acme uses, right? Um, basically just to see all this information. Cool. So this is what we're going to be implementing. If you want to follow along, um, go ahead and go to this GitHub link, download the repo. It's going to be a Node.js project. Um, so if you're on a Mac and stuff, I think you should be good to go. Uh, if you need help, just raise your hand, and one of, and one of us will come over. Um, but go ahead and clone this repo, then install the dependencies with npm install. Um, and then you should be good to go. So I'll give people a minute to do that. Raise your hand again if, if you need us to come over. Um, but otherwise, let's take a few minutes to just get that set up. So once you got that project downloaded and cloned, um, and actually, let me let me leave that link up there a bit longer um, before switching over. I'm sure present it. All right, I'll give it just a minute here. Again, raise your hand if if running into any issues, we're happy to come over and help. Maybe we'll just do a poll in a couple minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was, there's, can oh, you help sure. her? Yeah. Let me grab my mask. Okay. Do you mind if I? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I wonder if. And you're connected to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder, maybe, do you have an internal firewall that doesn't allow you to access GitHub? Yeah. What do you guys use for uh, version control? Do you use like a Bitbucket or GitHub, or do you have some internal tool for that? Since it's a completely separate department, I see. Yeah. Maybe I wonder let's if it would work on my I wonder if it would work on my tablet. Let's see if maybe Yeah, I think it's it's maybe kicking you out. Sorry about that. Um Yeah, let's try it. Um, good. Yeah, you got it. Go ahead. Cool. So when, once, you've, um, once you've downloaded the project, you should basically have this repo. And um, all we're going to be doing is working inside this vault.js file. You don't need to worry about anything else. 
right? We're essentially going to be implementing this vault.js class, which is a wrapper on top of our Mongo database. Um, and you can see it's got a couple of methods, right? We're going to insert some data. In order to insert that data, we're going to need to tokenize your card holder and your card number. Um, and we need to de-tokenize that data. And then finally, return it to the user. So in this exercise, we're just going to be implementing some of these stepped out methods here. So now um, what I'll have everyone do is actually go, up, go ahead and create a cluster on um, MongoDB. So yeah, again, this yeah. is a free account. If you sign up for MongoDB Atlas, okay. go ahead and create a new cluster, um, and then create a new database called MyVault with two collections, cards and tokens. And I'll show you what this looks oh, like yeah. once it's configured. Again, yeah, you if you need help, just shot. raise your hand. One of us will come over and uh, help you out with that. Um, but essentially, what you'll have is you'll have a cluster. Um, and then you'll have a database with two collections, a database called My Vault with two collections, cards and tokens. So go ahead and get that set up. And again, if you need any help, raise your hand, and we'll, we'll swing by. Yeah. So once you've, once you've configured this, you'll also want to go into database access here on the left. And you'll just want to set up a user that can actually, um, actually talk to the database. Right? So you'll give them a username. And uh, in the authentication method, you know, when you click on this, right, if you click edit and stuff, you want to choose password here. And then just set a password for your user. So go ahead and set up that user who can talk to this database. And the other thing that you'll just want to check real fast is that your network access section looks like this. All this means is that any IP address can talk to your database. Um, you know, Mongo lets you configure if you want to whitelist certain uh, IP addresses or IP ranges, but we don't, we don't want to get into that for this workshop. All right. Once all that's done, you'll actually be ready to connect to your database. So what I'm going to do here, and again, raise your hand if, if, uh, if you need some help, but I'm going to go back to the cluster, right? And if you click on Connect, and you can choose Connect Your Application, you'll get a connection string. Go ahead and copy this. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect to our database in our Vault class. So the first thing I'm going to do here is import my MongoDB client. So when you download, downloaded the um, npm install, it should have automatically downloaded the uh, MongoDB client with it as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So that should already be there. And if it's not, again, just raise your hand. And we're also going to install this UUID class or library here. So go ahead and import these two libraries. And then what we're going to do is actually connect to our Mongo client. So to do that, you write you know, this.client. Let's create a new variable called client in our vault class. right? And we're just going to say Mongo client here. And then here, the first parameter is that, that, that string that you copied, right? that connection string. 
So again, to get that, you go to your dashboard, hit connect, connect your application, and just copy that over. Awesome. OK, you're going to notice that in the uh, connection string, you've got this placeholder for your password, right? Um, you want to just type in what password you configured here. Uh, secure, so you know, for me, I'm just going to pass it in. Um, cool. Make sure you do that. And then also, this takes a, another set of parameters, which we'll go ahead and define here, which is um, use new URL parser. Use new URL parser. True. And then use unified topology. Use unified topology. True. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what these do. <laughs> but if you go to the MongoDB docs, this is how you initialize your client. So <laughs> let's make sure to do that. OK, cool. So this is the call to initial initialize your client, right? And what I'll do is, give me that a little bit bigger. Yeah. yeah. What we'll do is to test if this connection is good, we'll just call this.client.connect.connect, .connect, right? And what we'll do is we'll, t we'll give it a callback. So after trying to connect, it'll invoke this function. And if there's an error, what we can do is basically log out error connecting to database. And if not, then presumably we've connected successfully. So we can just say connection success. Awesome. OK, so let's pause here and go ahead and just start our project. So to do that, go to your terminal, you know, navigate to the directory with the project, and just hit npm start. Um, my project is running on port 3000. This may be slightly different for you, but most people should have it running on port 3000. So now if we go back to Chrome and just go to localhost 3000, we should get our application. This is the home page, right? You should see this, uh, this form come up. But also in your terminal, you should see connection success. If you don't see connection success, raise your hand, and we'll come over and help you. But essentially, um, essentially, this is basically saying that you were able to connect to that MongoDB database you created uh, successfully. I'm just going to turn word rep on there. Yeah, go for it. Nice. And we'll just leave this up for, for a minute. Yeah. So to recap, we've just entered in lines 1 through 17. And again, that connection string will be different for you. Um, to get it, go to your MongoDB dashboard if you need help with that. Call one of us over. Cool. OK. So now that we've successfully connected to our database, Let's implement the first method here, right? So the first thing we want to do is insert data into the vault and set that up, right? Now, to insert data into the vault, we'll need to actually tokenize the data that's coming in, right? Our vault is very simple, so it's only going to handle three kinds of data, right? The cardholder data, the card number data, and the expiration uh, date. Now, uh, you know, you're not supposed to store CVV, so we're not going to, we're not going to store that here. Um, but expiration date is actually not sensitive, right? So we're actually not going to go ahead and tokenize that. Instead, we're just going to tokenize cardholder name and card number. So let's start by doing something we call random tokenization, right, or random tokens. All that means is that we're going to generate completely random values as substitutes for the original data. Now, this is a really f like crude form of tokenization because the token that you get doesn't really tell you anything about the card number. And that's sort of the point, right? But it's also not very useful. But since we're building a basic vault, let's go ahead and just build that. And so these functions are super easy, right? All we're going to do to tokenize a cardholder um, name coming in is just return a UUID. Simple as that. And we're going to do the same thing here, right? So all we're saying here is when a cardholder name comes into the vault, we're just going to spit out a random UUID as a substitute token. When we get a card number coming into the vault, we're going to do the same thing. 
Awesome. Now, let's go ahead and actually write the insert method, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say await this.client.connect, right? So let's connect to our database. Then what we'll do is we'll create tokens for our card holder and our card number, right? So we'll go ahead and say var card holder token is equal to this dot um, tokenize card holder, and we'll pass in the card holder. Cool. And then here I'll say card number token is equal to this dot tokenize card number, and pass in the card number, right? And we don't need to tokenize expiration date, so we can just hold on for now. So now at this point in the code, right, we've generated tokens for the data that's coming in. Now what we want to do is we created two databases before, right? We created our tokens database, right, which is going to be on our infrastructure and is just the tokenized data. And then we've got the actual cards data in plain text, right, which is isolated. Um, and that's where we want to store the actual plain text values. So we're going to make two calls, right? One to actually insert the tokens, and then one to actually um, store the data. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so we'll wrap this all up in a little try catch loop. So first we'll do await. Um, oh, whoops. First I got to initialize the database. So I'm going to say const tokens is equal to this dot client dot database. And we're connecting to my vault or whatever you called your database, but I called my database my vault. And then I called the collection uh, tokens. And then we'll also connect to cards. And I'll call that one cards. Right? So now we've got two collections, tokens and cards. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to insert um, into my tokens database or my tokens uh, collection, which is just a key value store. Right? So essentially, we're generating a token for the card holder. We want to create a key value store for the real card holder name and the card holder token. So we're going to say await. Um, tokens dot insert many because we're going to insert two tokens here, right? The first one that we'll insert is the card holder token, and the real value is the card holder. And the second one that we'll do, right? So the token will be the card number token, and the value will be the card number. Okay. Awesome. So again, what we've done here, right, is we're inserting two records into the tokens collection. It's just a key value store where the key is the token and the value is the plain text data. And where this will be used is, well, when we want to actually retrieve the plain text data for whatever application needs it, right, we'll basically be able to pull, feed it a token and pull out a, um, a plain text value. Cool. So this is the first call. Now, the second thing I want to do right, is actually insert the cards data, the tokenized cards data, into the cards database. So I will go ahead and wrap this in a try catch loop. Await cards.insert1, because we're going to insert one record here. The card holder will be just the card holder token. The card number will just be the card number token. And the expiry date will just be the exp date. OK. Awesome. What, what am I doing wrong here? Oh, here we go. Boom. There we go. Awesome. Make sure we use objects and not arrays. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to <laughs> implement the catch portion earlier. So and, you know, if we catch an error in any of these inserts, let's just log out. You know, vault insert records failed, right? And we'll go ahead and return false, and we'll do the same thing here. Right? Okay. Let me pause here. Right? We wrote a lot of code. Let me go over it. So the first thing we're going to do is connect to our client, right? Then we're going to tokenize the data that's coming in. So you can see the data coming in is the card holder, the card number, and the expiration date. We only need to tokenize the first two, because those are what are sensitive. 
and we're going to call those tokenized cardholder and card number methods we implemented earlier. Then we're going to connect to the collections that we created, and then we're going to make two database writes, right? One, we're inserting just the tokens, the key value pairs, and then we're actually inserting the cardholder token data in the, in, in the other database. Okay. So now, and at the risk of making a mistake while live coding, I'm going to run my code. Um, and let's see if, if this works, right? So what I expect here is I'll be able to start my, uh, my, my server here. And what I'm hoping for is when I insert this data, I'll basically get something that says true. It'll return true, which means we successfully inserted this data. And I should be able to see that data in my MongoDB atlas. So I'm going to go ahead and give everyone Evis's credit card information. <laughs> Just joking. There's a lot of student loans on there, so don't worry about it. <laughs> one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, there's no form validation on this, uh, so you know, just pretend, except for the credit card number. Uh, that does have to be 16 digits. But let's go ahead and insert this, this information, hit submit, and it didn't work. So <laughs> let's, let's do some live debugging. Or did it? You might not have returned true. Ah, that's exactly why. Yep. It did work. I just didn't return true here. So what we're going to do, just to make ourselves feel better, is rerun this and reinsert those records. So really, we should see both those records inserted. One, 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 two, three, one, two, three. Hit submit. True. There we go. OK, cool. So theoretically, our um, insert was, was successful, and we should be able to see those objects created in our MongoDB dashboard. So cards is going to be the tokenized data, right? That's what we're pretending is actually on our infrastructure. And tokens is, is supposed to be isolated somewhere because it's got plain text values. Um, so you can see that there's a bunch of records inserted here, which is good. And you know, the expiry date kind of matches up. Notice that the expiry date is in plain text here because um, it's not sensitive, and we've decided, sort of as the designers and as the architects, that that data can be in plain text. On the other hand, let's look at this tokens key value store, right? So you can see the token that was generated for Evis's name, right? And you can see the token that was generated um, for his card number as well, right? And similarly, for the second time we inserted that data for, for my card number and my name. Cool. So we know that insert is working. Great. Right? Um, we're able to put data into the vault. Right? Now what we want to do is actually get data out of the vault so that we can build our internal Acme dashboard. Right? So let's go ahead and do that. Now, to build this, right, the first thing we'll have to do is implement this get um, function. So what I'm going to do is just say await oh, this.client.connect. Again, just connect to the database, right? And then we'll go ahead and initialize the same collections here. Cool. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to pull all the records from the vault just so we can display them. So I'm going to say this is cards.find. And it's just going to find all of them. We're going to pass in an empty query string so that we get all the results. We're going to get an array of results. And then we're going to say we're going to iterate through all the different results. And just append them to our array. So we'll just say results.push doc. And then we'll return results. OK. So what did we do here? Right? We connected to our client, and we initialized our tokens and cards databases. Uh, we passed a query to our cards database, basically said, find everything, right? just return everything. And then we pushed all of those into this thing called uh, results, and we returned that. So once you've done this, you should now be able to hit the all endpoint of your project. So if you go to localhost 3000 slash all, we have an error. All right, live debugging time. This is all part of the fun. <laughs> um, this.client.connect, cards, 
Oh, wait, I think it was how the, does that uh, find? The response.json from last time. Sorry? I think it was. Oh, let me see. Let's see what's going on here. Yes. This is the real developer experience. We did it on purpose, of course. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cannot read property length of undefined. I Interesting. Think, remember, la I think last time. Is is empty. Yeah. Yeah. So what is going on? Return results. Results dot push doc. What, what calls, what calls, right? Yeah. So what's going on in the background is. You have all, and what it's doing is it's rendering table view and passing the cards. Uh, JSON. No, no, that's different. So this needs to. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, so I think what it's saying is cards is actually, because you know, if you look at this view in table, um, it's probably trying to iterate through these cards, and it's coming up empty. So what's really happening here is it looks like, for some reason, I'm not able to get. Great idea. Let's do that. So what we can do is we can say console.log results. Right? Um, let's see if we're even getting the results from the project or from the database. Sorry? Mm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That could be it. Maybe. I thought I saved it. I love this collaborative debugging, so I'm all about it. OK. Hey, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> all right. 10 points to Gryffindor. Cool. Um, great. So now that you've implemented the all endpoint, right, you should basically get a very simple dashboard that gives you your card holder, your card number, and your expiry date. Of course, the sensitive data is actually redacted from your database, and instead you're just seeing the tokens. Now, the way we've got this application set up is that you should be able to click on a token, and that will detokenize it. But we haven't implemented that yet, so let's go ahead and do that. So, to detokenize a field, right, all we need to do is make a call out to that tokens database. So, we're gonna do the same thing await this.client.connect, right? We're gonna say const tokens, and let me just make sure. Cool. Yep. Is equal to this.client.database. Um, whoops. Our database is my vault dot collection. And this is tokens. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna fetch, we've got a token coming in, and we want to fetch the document that has that as the token field. So we'll say find one where the token is equal to the token we received as a parameter. Um, await this dot, or sorry, await tokens dot find one. Okay, cool. This is our doc, and then what we'll say is like if we if we found it, right? We'll return doc dot value. If you remember, we stored this as token and value, so we want to return the value field of the doc. And then otherwise, we can just throw an error. We can, or we can just say return null. And what we'll do is we'll just say we'll just log this out. Log, um, couldn't find, oops, could not find matching doc. OK. Cool. So with this done, let's restart the server <laughs> this time. And now, once we go to our all database, we should be able to click on one of these and get the plain text value. So very simple tokenization, detokenization, right? So great. At this point, what we've built is, in, is a very, very poor man solution for a data vault. right? Um, let me do a quick time check. There was one more step that I wanted to cover. 10 minutes. All right. Um, what I can do is, I think mean, we should keep going. Maybe just skip it? Yeah. OK. Well, this is a very, very poor man's data vault. right? What we've been able to do is get data in through the form, right? Um, tokenize it with the vault and then feed it to a downstream application uh, like this dashboard uh, in tokenized form. 
right? So theoretically, now our infrastructure is all isolated from the actual PII data. The tokens database is completely separate, uh, and we can sleep, safe, sleep well at night. The other step that we don't have time for right now is how do you implement a format preserving token? You can actually see an example of one from, a, from when I was working on this before, right? If you notice that second row, it looks different from the rest because that's a format preserving token. And what it's done is it's actually preserved the first four digits and the last four digits of the card number and basically put random text, not random, like a, you know, actual token in between. So the point of doing that is it's still not sensitive data, right? But sometimes you need the last four digits just to, you know, for example, if you go onto Amazon and you're choosing which card to pay with, Amazon will show you the last four digits of your card, right? So you can select that card, right? You might need the first four digits so you know which payment network it's actually going to be processed over. So things like that um, are called format preserving tokens, where you can basically build tokens bespoke to your data type that reveal just the right amount of information but redact the rest. So we, unfortunately, we don't have time to get to that right now. But um, if we want to do that, there's a very simple uh, kind of fix. And what we can do is we'll push the finished code to that repository um, if anyone is curious. Cool. So with that, I'm going to go back to the presentation and just do a quick recap of what we did, right? So we built a very, very simple vault, you know, quote unquote vault, that tokenizes PCI data coming in. Uh, we did not create a format preserving token, but we'll save that for next time. Now let, let's talk about some shortcomings of our vault, right? Perhaps the biggest one is it only supports fixed data types. Right? Even inside the vault code, you saw that the vault knew what kind of data it was going to expect. There, ha there was you know, bespoke functions for every single data type, how we tokenized it. So it's really kind of hard-coded. Right? If we wanted to tomorrow store you know, a different you know, ACH data, let's say, we wouldn't be able to do that. We'd need to completely, or we'd need to add more code to our vault. So it only supports four fixed data types. There's no di dynamic redaction or masking. Right? You either get the whole plain text value, or you get the whole token. Right? If I wanted to give my team um, just the last four digits, right, uh, I'd have to, I have to create a whole new token for that. There's no way for me to just selectively pull that out of the plain text value. There's no governance. Right? Any users or apps that are talking to this vault get the same level of access. Right? Maybe I don't want one of my teams to actually touch any of the, um, maybe, you know, maybe they only need the cardholder name. They don't need the number at all. But there's no way for me to do that here. Um, it's obviously not isolated, right? Like our backend, that data still flows through our backend. So even in that code we wrote, at some point the backend will still have to decrypt the data and pass it downstream, right? That's not great. Uh, and then finally, like we can't really use our data to invoke third-party APIs without detokenizing it, right? If I wanted to call Stripe with this data, right, the best I can do right now is detokenize the data on my backend and then call Stripe. But by doing that, I've now exposed my backend to the very data that I was trying to isolate it from. And obviously, it's not enterprise ready, right? There's a laundry list of features that you need to really launch something like this in production. Key management, audit logging, you know, SIEM integrations, maybe you want data residency, the list goes on and on, right? Um, but hopefully, this illustrates why you would want a vault, right? And like, if you wanted to create one, um, how you'd go about doing it. So hopefully, at this point, I've convinced you that like, a vault is the right way to go, right? why you should use it. Let's look at some of the options you have for building a vault for real. Right? If you actually wanted to go out and build this, what are some of the options you have? The first option is to kind of do it yourself. Right? And uh, that is a bold undertaking. A lot of companies do this, right? especially the really big companies. But be warned, it takes a lot of expertise. Right? Um, security is a really broad, ambiguous term for a lot of different disciplines. And these are a couple of the areas of expertise that you would need to really build something like this, right? From your encryption algorithms to just you know, database performance and architecture to governance, you know, RBAC, PBAC, um, key management, hardcore security stuff like auditing, uh, and, and you know, infrastructure deployment, VPCs. So it's hard, right? It's doable, but it's really hard. Uh, and you need to assemble a team with a lot of expertise. Option number two is there are a lot of point solutions for each of these things, right? So if you want a service that just does tokenization, you can get that. Maybe you can hook it up to an encrypted database, right? Get that one. 
maybe you can also get another solution, right, buy another product that does data categorization and mapping and hook that up, right? And then maybe you can buy a data governance platform, right, uh, and sort of hook it into all these other systems. And then on top of that, you know, maybe you, you know, your infra team sort of now needs to juggle all these different services, um, so you buy some products for like a service mesh, maybe you get a VPC. So the point is, you can string together a lot of disparate solutions if you're willing to kind of maintain that, right? There's a lot of upkeep there. Again, you need the same amount of expertise, even if you're not building it, but to run it, right? Um, any DevOps folks here will know, will know the pain of that, right? That's option number two. And then option number three, obviously we couldn't let you go without a plug, um, is to buy an actual data vault, right? Like we've studied how these are built in industry and we've essentially boiled all these best practices down into a really scalable generic data vault um, that can be delivered as an API. Um, and we're hoping that it'll help you know, the next wave of FinTech uh, startups really get to market faster. Um, cool, so with that, in summary, just use a data vault. Right? If you haven't seen this meme before, ignore it. <laughs> uh, but essentially, yeah, right? Like, this is a hard thing to build. You know, however you choose to build it, um, instead of you know, just using an encrypted database or something, uh, just use a data vault. Cool. So with that, we will oops, conclude. Um, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate you all spending your time here and being an active audience. We've left a QR code to a white paper so if you want uh, from Skyflow, which will go over, again, you know, what is a data vault? I think, oh, I think the gentleman who asked the question about the architecture left, but that white paper will go into the architecture of that vault a little bit. Um, so do check that out if you're interested. Um, and cool. And then if you want to follow Evis or I on Twitter or LinkedIn or connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, please do so. We'll be here all week in the corner, the Skyflow booth. So if you want to chat more, uh, we'd love to have you. Please swing by. Um, we're gonna thank you. We're going to hang around here for a couple minutes, so if you guys have any questions, want to chat, you know, please uh, yeah, don't hesitate to come up. Yes, I can oh, do that. That's a good idea. We should do that. Yeah, yeah. certainly we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.